Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Okay, cool. If you're a guest here today, my name is Brandon, one of the pastors here on staff, and I want to welcome you here today. In fact, uh, we have a big green pillar, so after service here today, uh, we'd love to show our appreciation, got a little goodie bag, love to get connected with you if you are a guest. Uh, But I got a quick announcement for all the ladies in the house. We have a women's event coming up. And it's out at Roush World. They're going to have all kinds of games and activities out there. But rumor has it that there's been some grumbling amongst the ladies wanting to get their hillbilly on out at Roush World because of the men's event. Yeah, see, you can kind of hear it right now in this room. So, uh, ladies, you can, like, may, I don't know if you have your own ATV or whatever, uh, or maybe you borrow someone else's, uh, but you can get your hillbilly on out at Roush World, because the guys totally did, and we had a really awesome time out there. But, ladies, it's just an awesome time to get connected with some other ladies from the church, be encouraged, and then also just simply having some fun out there. So I want to encourage you, get signed up for the women's event. Also, uh, some of you, you have to commute a little ways on uh, your way to work, or maybe you're out mowing or something. I like to listen to audiobooks and podcasts, and I want to encourage you to check out Radiant Reflections. Uh, Pastor JB and Pastor Josh, uh, they co-host this uh, show together. I've been blessed to be on there as well, but they have different guests that come on there. And if you're encouraged by some of the teachings and the things that we talk about here on stage, they go way further in depth into conversation. And they, you guys have a pretty good conversation about coffee typically at that as well. So um, yeah, you, you got to just check it out just for them to try to figure out what a coffee tastes like. And you're like, what do you mean? Just, just put it in and let it drip. No, 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 they, you got to have your pinky out, and even when you listen to these guys. <laughs> so wherever, wherever you listen to podcasts, I want you, I want to encourage you, go check out Radiant Reflections, and church family, man, you, you live into to disciplines, you try to make God first in multiple areas of your life, and one of those is through your giving, so thank you so much for that. Uh, it allows us to, to host events, to, to have a minimal cost with all of that. So thank you in the way that you give. Would you guys go ahead and stand with me? I'm going to read from Psalm 34. And man, after sitting through first service, God just really moved. And I fully expect him to move again here for this second service. But sometimes we can come into this space Uh, with all kind of burdens and junk and distractions. Let's just slow down for a moment. Maybe even begin to slow your breathing down. And I want to read a couple of verses here this morning. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. And, And maybe some of you you, you have fears. You, you have fear that you're not sure how this situation's gonna play out that you're dealing with. Maybe there's some anxiety that's going along with that. Verse five says, those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. Maybe you're walking in here because you're ashamed. Maybe you're ashamed of something that you did last night. Something a while ago. I want to remind you in God's word in Lamentations 3.23, it says his mercies are new every morning. So maybe this morning can be just a reset. We're here. We want to seek out the presence of God. We, We want to have an encounter with him. We want to engage in Holy Spirit. And so this first song that we're going to sing is is welcoming Holy Spirit. But depending on what your theology is, Holy Spirit's already here. Maybe it's time for us to be more aware of Holy Spirit, that that the eyes of our hearts would be open and aware to Him trying to move in this space, but more importantly, in our hearts and our minds. So if you don't mind, just, just close your eyes, slow your breathing down, And so maybe say a prayer, something like this. Holy Spirit, help me be aware. 
Holy Spirit, please help me with this distraction that's consuming my mind. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed in my heart and my mind right now in this moment. So Lord, would you just do what you can do here this morning? We do invite your holy presence here. We ask that you would move in an incredible way that your glory would just show up in this place. That we as a movement of people will be marked not by a song, not by any pastor, but by the presence of the creator of the universe. Would you mark us here? We are welcome to that. Help us to have an encounter with you, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let us experience the 
glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. thinking about the flood and how the glory of God brought such judgment. He just let loose and flooded the whole earth and all of humanity except a a select few were saved from the glory of God. Outside of the blood of Jesus, the glory of God We can't be in his throne room. We can't be before him without that covering. The glory of God would just wipe us away. So we come into this place and we sing a song like, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Your glory, your glory, this glory that has power to bring such destruction. When we say your glory is what our hearts long for. Lord, we long to be in a, that safe place and such a power something so mighty that yet we can stand right in the middle of it and experience that presence of God. Brothers and sisters, this is such a joy. This is such a thing. It's a miracle that we can stand, even stand before this creator of the universe. He spoke and all that we see and know just became. I'm going to ask God to stir up that glory in this room and stir up that glory in our hearts. We would truly experience his presence here this morning. Set a fire down in my soul I can't contain, I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God Set a fire down in my soul 
It's just voices. Let it be the true prayer and cry of our heart this morning. That God, you would set a fire deep down. I want more. I want more. Voices only. Let's do it as a prayer together. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain. I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want to lift your hands, lift your hands. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. <laughs> Heavenly Father, that's our united cry this today. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we come together and we cry out, God, we want more of you. God, sometimes our flesh gets in the way. Sometimes it's the enemy of our soul that's just there to trip us up. We can't do it alone. And you gave us the comforter, the helper, Holy Spirit, and we need him more and more. 
We need him to sanctify our lives so each and every morning we wake up, we look at ourselves and say, I am an image bearer of the God and be sanctified to mature in my faith to look more and more like Jesus Christ to where I work, where I live, and where I play. Lord, would you set a fire in the heart of this church, your bride, Radiant Life. Set us on fire. God, we are stronger together when we are a coal that's burning and we come together. It's a fire that's burning hot. Help us to know that. But it goes beyond just the gathering of Sunday morning. Our faith goes into Monday through Sunday. Just continue to burn deep down inside of us. And Lord, we do want to pray for all the other churches in our community here and beyond. Would you burn brightly, Holy Spirit? Set those churches on fire. May they see an increase because we're taking ground against the enemy. Lord, we have our differences. We have our little flair of this and that, but we can set aside because we're on the same team and it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So would you set those churches on fire? Would we see your kingdom come here in Sturgis and beyond as it is in heaven? Lord, thank you. Thank you for reaching down, picking us up when we've fallen. Thank you for our salvation. <laughs> Thank you for freedom that's only found in the name of Jesus Christ. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Hey, before you take a seat real quick, would you fist bump four people around you and say welcome to church this morning? Hey, buddy. Hey, real quick, while you guys are like getting arranged and, and uh, running around and giving fist bumps this morning, um, we are gonna celebrate communion here in a little while. So if you don't have a communion cup, that means you did a great job of walking around the obstacle we tried to put in front of you when you came in. So please feel free in the now 30 seconds to get up and go to the, one of those three exit doors right there at a table and grab a communion cup, okay? Here at Radiant Life, you don't have to be a member at Radiant Life. We just ask that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And then you can take communion here at Radiant Life. So um, we're not judging anyone right now that's getting up and going to the back. No, we're not. Uh, I called out one of our elders of our church actually got up first service and went to the back and I totally called him out on that. Um, there's a joke that I say, we judge because we care. And that's not really, but really. <laughs> so, hey, if you never met me, my name's Ryan. I'm our lead pastor here at Radiant Life. And uh, I'm gonna tell you what, I love teaching the word of God. You know, there are some times where I look in the mirror and go, God, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing? Why did you ever call me back to my home city? Why did you ever call me back to the church I never even wanted to come back to? No offense to our church, I just didn't wanna come back. Right? I mean, I love the Grand Rapids area, big city, lots of things to do, all se you know, semi-professional sports there. I loved being able to go to hockey games and basketball, uh, not, not basketball, what else did we go to? Baseball games and all that stuff. I didn't want to come back to 11,000 people in Sturgis. Uh, but I look in the mirror and go, God, I know my purpose. And I love being here. As crazy as it sounds, I love being here. I realize I'm not a big city guy. I want to be, <laughs> but I'm not because traffic drives me crazy, right? There's a right lane for a reason, first and foremost. You know what that's called? It's called the slow lane. Get out of the fast lane and stay in the slow lane. All right, I love the staff member. There's a certain staff member that won't per put the Radiant Life burst on their vehicle because of how they drive. <laughs> Some of you, I see that burst and going, oh, dear God, they come to this church. I see how they're driving. <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying all this. 
because we got a lot of ground to cover today. Um, I love teaching. I just, so you know, I, like this morning, I'm going to get passionate. My face is red because I'm sunburned, not because I'm angry. All right. Uh, we went to Lake Michigan just as a final last day before kids go to school. And I was like, I don't need sunscreen. It's like cloudy and the sun's going in and out of the clouds. I'm good. No, my body told me something else when I got home last night. I'm like putting an aloe on. I'm like, ah. I woke up this morning. I was like, my face is so red. I did not realize. So I'm not angry this morning. It's uh, the sun, okay? Hey, if you got your Bible, if you have your phone or tablet, will you turn to the gospel according to Mark chapter 14? All summer long, we've been in a series titled Mark, and uh, we've been looking at the life of Jesus. And uh, next week, we'll be able to wrap it up in chapters 15 and 16 next week. And then after that, it's Labor Day weekend, and college football is back. Yes, right? And then we get to watch. No, 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 go Spartan. No, we don't say that here. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, <laughs> So that weekend, Labor Day, stay with me, Labor Day weekend on Sunday, uh, what we're going to do Labor Day weekend is just have a worship communion devotion set for us. Then the following week, we're going to start our new series that will be a five-weeker called Controversial Jesus. Tagline, we need to talk. And we're going to engage for five weeks into cultural moments that are confusing Christians Yet, we need to look always at the word of Jesus to see what he says. And then I told my staff this. I said, after that, I'm going to run away for two weeks so the hate mail can be answered by someone else, not me. (laughs) But we will disagree on many topics, but we will disagree in love and grace. And we will act like adults and have those difficult conversations, even though you and I may be looking at the same thing, but we're looking at it with different views. But that's for like three more weeks. Right now, oh, I didn't even show you. Uh, We got to get here. Mark 14, we're going to cover verses 17 to 25. I've titled this message, Who is Invited to the Table? If you are there at Mark 14, let me hear you say word. Word. We get in the word, so the. And if you are a visitor and you're like, what did they just say? Don't feel bad. We believe that we get into the word of God so the word of God gets inside of us. We don't want it just to come here to here to head knowledge. We want it to come from head knowledge into heart transformation. God's word says it's alive and active. It's a double-edged sword. And I love being able to sit there and go, God, this is your word. What do you have to say to us today? Let's look. There's so many things happening in Mark uh, chapter 14. And I don't know why. I just realized this actually, next slide, on, it says Mark 9. It's not Mark 9, it's Mark 14, just so you know, okay? So here we go. Mark na- uh, 14, verse. <laughs> That's horrible. Mark 14. I'm in 14 in my Bible. Hopefully you are too. Mark 14, 17. It says this When evening came, he, referring to Jesus, arrived with the 12, the 12 being his disciples. While they were reclining, they were what, friends? If you are okay and you're one that wants to circle in your Bible, circle that word, highlight that word, underline that word. That word brings significant meaning to what we're going to talk about today. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and say to him one by one, surely not I. He said to them, it is one of the 12, the one who is dipping bread in the bowl with me. For the son of man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Ouch. This is the word of God. What's, what I love about this story is there's so many different clues and nuggets that Mark is giving us, but what you and I have to do to fully appreciate what we just read together, you and I have to jump back 2,000 years and understand first century Judaism. 
I need you to say something with me this morning. Say, context matters. Ready? Context matters. One more time. Context matters. There are rhythms in lifestyle things that happen in first century Israel that you and I just don't do 2,000 years later. We don't walk everywhere. We get on a bike, we run, we have vehicles. They didn't. Their lifestyle's different. They, cl- they were able to go through cleansing rituals different than what you and I did. They don't have baths all over the place like you and I do in our homes. So things have changed, but in order to appreciate what John is actually saying that's happening, you and I have to go back 2,000 years ago into the first century world that Jesus is living into to understand these small nuances. Here's an example. This is the Lord's Supper we read together. They're at the Lord's Supper. When you and I think of the Lord's Supper, unfortunately, we think this which is completely incorrect, by the way. And we go, thank you, Da Vinci, for ruining everything we ever thought about the Lord's Supper. What is the key word I told you to circle or highlight? Reclining. Hey, Da Vinci, are they reclining? See, culture's changed. In the first century world, you reclined at at a table. You and I today, we sit like this. So we have to jump back and say, what is their table setting? What does it look like? Why are they reclining? By the way, Dan Brown wrote the book, The Da Vinci Code. Christians were up in arms about this book. And I'm sitting back go, guys, we're all right. First of all, it's fiction, okay? Second of all, if we know cultural context, his book doesn't matter to us. And we get all up in arms over a picture that's not even biblical. (laughs) So let's dive in together. What is this reclining thing that's happening? All throughout the Gospels, you'll see a lot that Jesus and his disciples or Jesus and his guests or he shows up at a house, they're reclining at a table. Here's the word that you're going to want to write in your Bible and you're down, down. Write the word triclinium. Let me hear you say triclinium. Triclinium is the meal century in the first century world in Palestine, in Israel, in Judaism. This is what the word means. Tri, which means three, and then clinium, which means couch, chase lounge. So you put it all together, it is a three-sided couch. Ah, We're not talking about the dining room table you and I have. This is completely different. So let's study. Here's a picture of a dining room that was very similar to what Jesus would have been in in this story. What you see here is a beautiful mosaic tile and what's outlined in white would have been where you would have reclined or where the dining table would have been per se. The area in the middle was for the area for servers to bring food. I have a small example here on stage with me. As a server to food, I can serve everyone in this triclinium setting very easily. And everyone's lounging around on these three couches, so to speak. What's interesting about how one was to lay on the couch which most of the time, these were on the ground or a slight elevated platform, not very high. They would, the three, or whoever's at the meal, would come and you would recline on your left side. Why your left side? Because you were supposed to be right-handed dominant. If you were a lefty, you were considered weird. Sorry. And so... In the ancient world, you reclined on your left side and you shared a meal together. Now, what is so fascinating about this is there are four positions that were designated to be special at this meal in a triclinium setting. These are those positions. One through three were right here on the same side. Four was at the very end on the opposite side. Now, I'm going to contest to you that you and I can 
piece together from all the gospels exactly where and who is in each spot in the Last Supper in the triclinium setting by looking at all the other gospel writers and trying to figure out what is Jesus doing here in this moment at the Last Supper. So what I'm gonna do for about 10 minutes, I need, thir- don't move yet, 13 volunteers. I'm gonna ask for men or boys in the room because I'm not being sexist. It's just, it's Jesus and 12 guys, okay? So I just wanna represent that, that's all. And if I don't have 13 men willing to, listen, you get to lay down in church, right? Here's the good thing. And there's treats up here. You are free to eat. I have to entice you with chocolate and Kit Kats and Hershey's and Reese PCs and Twizzlers. I gotta entice you, okay? So can I just get 13 men or boys, whoever, come on up stage. We need 13 of you. Don't all rush the stage at one time. Okay, one. This is great. And, and I, I wanna apologize, it is tight. So men, you're gonna have to snuggle a little bit. Okay, there we go. What up? Oh man, we need a lot more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I need four more. I'm not a math teacher. Nine, 10, 11. I'm off counting now, aren't I? Because that was just four. Uh, what, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. One more. One more. Yeah, that's 12. Unless I'm counting wrong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I need one more. Why one more? We got 12 disciples in Jesus. 12 plus one is 13. Thank you. Choose wherever you want. Gentlemen, enjoy, eat, just be quiet while I'm speaking. All right, so (laughs) our nine o'clock service, they're all chit-chatting. I'm like, be quiet, all right? So here you have this triclinium setting where they're reclining on their left side. This three-sided couch, and we know at least that there are four designated positions in this setting. The very first to know is this. The host is always the second one in. Who's the host of the Last Supper? Come on, yeah, that's easy, right? He tells his disciples, hey, you gotta go prepare this meal. Go into that town, find that guy. That guy, tell him I need the upper room, and then I'm gonna have this my dinner I've been eagerly desiring to have with you all, right? We know he's the second one in. One, two, you are Jesus, okay? Just keep your head small though, humility, humility. Just clothe yourself in humility right now, okay? He's Jesus, the second one in in the triclinium setting was the host, this being Jesus. Now again, I would contest you, we know all the other positions based on all the details all the other gospel writers give us. Why do the gospel writers give us good detail? Because you and I got to understand, again, first century Judaism and what their dining room table looked like. So let's look at John. John gives us two significant details in John chapter 13. And here's what John says in his. He says, one of his disciples The one Jesus loved. Now, who is that? That's John, right? It's his nickname that he gives himself. I'm the one Jesus loved. Was reclining close beside Jesus. It continues, Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who he was talking about, right? Who wants to know? Like, hey, ask him, like, who's gonna betray him? So he leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? He already knows, right? There's only one position this could possibly be that can lean back. The original text actually says to lean back against his chest. There is only one position that could possibly be that where John is sitting. John is right here at the end of the triclinium. Now this is what's fascinating. That position was to be held by the host's right hand man. Wait a minute. If you know anything about the disciples, you and I are probably thinking the same thing. 
that should be Peter. Peter's like the oldest of the disciples. He's the leader. He's given all this stuff from Jesus. Like, it would make sense that this would be Peter. I would contest to you, Jesus has something in store for Peter. That's, that's why Peter's not there. I would also contest to you that John has one of the most special relationships with Jesus. John is part of the inner three, Peter, James, and John. There's only one disciple at the crucifixion. Who's that? John. And Jesus looks at John and says, behold your mom. Mom, behold your son. He gives John the responsibility to take care of his mom. But I love what John gives us another detail. It says this, Simon Peter motioned to him, John, to find out who he was talking about. Here's what's fascinating about this. Absolutely fascinating. My brother here eating Reese's Pieces. <laughs> oh, you can still eat them. You don't have to give them away. <laughs> right here at the end of the table, this is the only spot that you can see everyone very clearly. That's the clearest sight of everyone. Right? This is the worst sight of everyone. The right hand man. I would contest to you that Peter is in this spot who can easily motion to John who John only has the clear eyesight for and here's what this role is. It's the servant role. Why is the end of the triclinium the servant role? Because he sees everyone and he knows what all you guys need. And at this meal, John gives us detail too that says this. Who is the disciple that has the biggest issue that Jesus washes all their feet? Makes sense. It would have been the role of the servant. And it says, Jesus gets up from this meal and begins, and Peter's like, no, Jesus, not my feet. I would contest because Peter knows that's my role. I'm the servant, you put me here. And earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says this, he calls them over, referring to his disciples, and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them but it must not be like that among you. In other words, you're going to lead differently. He says, on the contrary, however, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Hey, Peter, one day, the Christian faith, you will be that guy. You, will, you don't know, but centuries from now, they're gonna build a massive cathedral and call it the St. Peter's Basilica. You're the one I've given authority to. You're the one I actually said the keys of heaven belong to you. You wait, but I gotta give you a lesson because this is my last time with the 12. The greatest among you must be willing to serve. Peter, you have no idea what your greatness is gonna be. I need you. One last lesson, be the servant, not my right-hand man. Because my right-hand man, John, he's gonna take on a lot with my mother. I also think Matthew gives one other clue on who someone is. Actually, Mark gave the same clue. There's one other position. We're wondering who you are, the third position. Matthew says this, the one, this is Jesus saying, it's the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl. He's the betrayer. <laughs> I mean, I don't blame you. I'd cover my face too, brother. <laughs> so in the triclinium setting, you would pair up in threes or fours. The bowl definitely would be in front of the hosts. You guys dig, you guys would dig together, you guys would dig, and so on and so forth and share. The third position, I would contest to you through Matthew and Mark's details that that right there is Judas. 
as Jesus would dip bread in the bowl and go, you're sharing with me on the left, dip, dip. You're sharing with me on the right. And guess what position this is? It's the guest of honor. What is Jesus doing? John, the right-hand man in this moment, Jesus the host, Judas. Oh, Judas. Jesus says, it's better for you to have not been born. But I could possibly have you at the guest of honor at my table, knowing you're going to betray me. Can we thank these guys for being up here, for being participants? You guys can grab the candy if you want. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. There's a reason why parents don't call their kids Judas anymore, so I'm glad. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I was hosting this meal and I was Jesus, and I'm laying in the host spot, you know who nowhere near me is? My betrayer. And if I'm honest, my flesh may get the best of me. I wouldn't even invite my betrayer to this table. Go somewhere else. Go somewhere else, Judas. But what I think Jesus is trying, one of the points we can get out of this triclinium setting in the Last Supper is this. No matter what you've done, you're invited to the table. You're invited to his table. And as I was studying this week, I was just blown away. I was sitting on my front porch, which by the way, I think we ought to bring the front porch back. Get out of the backyard and the fence and start sitting on the front porch and be a community and be a light for Jesus Christ. That's a sidebar, sorry. Everything changed when the front porch became the back patio. In our culture, everything began to change. Bring it back. By the way, I was sitting out there. That's why I sit out there. I'm like, I'm changing it. It's going to take one. I'm sitting out there. So you can honk when you go by my house. And uh, if I have earbuds, I may not hear you because they're noise-canceling earbuds. So if I don't wave, I'm not being a jerk. I promise. I'm sitting out there. I'm like, God, oh, we're invited to the table. Jesus, obviously, you are the son of God. You are fully man and fully God yet. So much better than I am, because I, I wouldn't invite Judas. <laughs> and here's the crazy part. Jesus knows everything you will ever do, and he still invites you to the table. <laughs> what you did last night, <laughs> he invites you to his table. What you did two months ago, two years ago, 20 years ago, he says, you are invited to my table because grace is bigger than holding a grudge. And you're invited to the table. I wanna ask you a question. Who's invited to your table? I wrestled with this because here's the simple answer. People like me because I'm comfortable with people who look like me, have the same belief system I do. I'm comfortable with that. And I tend to say that's where it's at. Only people are invited to my table who look like me. And man, was Jesus wrecking me this week. But look who I had at my table. Yes, the one who I loved but I also had Peter, the one who would deny me. I had Judas, the one who would betray me. And I had Thomas, the one who doubted me at the table. Ouch. And if I'm being honest, it's a whole lot easier to hold a great grudge than to offer grace. What about that one person who hurt you deeply? 
And that name comes up and you know immediately your heart looks like it's got roots of bitterness all over. Are they still invited to your table? Grudge or grace? Worship team, make your way up. By the way, we're not done. We still got some verses, but there's gonna be some songs and I'm gonna come up in between songs. But I wanna ask you a question this morning. Think about this. Do you love Jesus? Man, maybe for some of you, it's been like just a fresh awakening with Jesus. Like you are new in your faith and you're like, absolutely, I can say yes. Or others of you, you've been walking with Jesus for 30 years and you're just growing and you just love Jesus more and more each and every day. Do you love Jesus? Listen, you're invited to the table. Have you ever questioned Jesus before? Jesus, my life does not look good right now. I can't get my marriage to work. I can't get my kids to do what they want to do. Kids make fun of me at school. Is this really worth it, Jesus? Have you ever questioned Jesus? You're still invited to the table. Have you ever denied Jesus? Denied him in a sense that you know in this moment the Spirit of God is tugging on your heart to talk about Jesus in front of that coworker or friend or teammate. And you know and you slide back out of that conversation and you don't bring up Jesus. And you go, man, it feels like I denied him in that moment. And that was a divine opportunity. And then the rhema, the spoken word of God that the Spirit of God uses plants in your heart and you're reminded of that verse when Jesus says, Deny me before the Father. I'll de or deny me in front of others. I'll deny you before the Father. But acknowledge me before others. I'll acknowledge you before the Father. I've had that happen. Even your pastor that doesn't always live into a holy boldness moment. I backed away. And if you've ever been there, you're still invited to the table. Have you ever betrayed Jesus? You've turned your back on him. You're still invited to the table. He still died for you. You ever turn your back on Jesus, but thank God the hound of heaven has pursued you and brought you back. You're invited to his table. Ryan, how do I get to his table? I'm thankful that God says, everyone's invited to my table when the blood of my, my body covers you. You don't earn a seat at the table. You receive your seat at the table. There's nothing you can do. There's no striving. There's no, I'm trying to be the best me I can none of that you just receive the blood of Jesus over you and you have a seat at his table Colossians 1:20 says this and through him referring to Jesus and through him to reconcile everything to himself whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross the blood of Jesus invites you to take your seat at the table. Ephesians 1, 7, in him, Jesus, we have redemption. How? Through the blood of Jesus. And we have the forgiveness of sins because of the blood of Jesus. According to the riches of his grace, he is showering us, as John writes, grace upon grace, showering you so you have a seat at his table. First John says this, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. 
And with that cleansing, you can receive your seat at the table. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary, how can we come to the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary into God's presence through the blood of Jesus? That's how you're invited to the table. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate, referring to the gate that surrounded Jerusalem on Golgotha's hill, so that he might sanctify you and I. How? By his blood. Sanctified. No longer a sinner. I'm sanctified by the blood of Christ. To him who loves us and set us free from our sins. How? By the blood of Jesus. How much more then? Since we have been justified, a legal term, that when Jesus sees or God sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees you're clothed in his son, Jesus Christ. You've been justified how? By the blood of Jesus. You can take your seat at the table because of the blood of Jesus.
Mark 14, 22. As they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them and said, take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant. <laughs> this word covenant, covenant means agreement. And Jesus is saying, there's a new covenant. It's my blood for the forgiveness of sins. It's my blood to sanctify you. It's my blood that justifies you right standing before God. And look at it, he says this, it's poured out for many. I'm glad I'm part of that many. <laughs> it's part of the many. Truly I tell you though, I'll no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. See, in the upper room in the triclinium, Jesus was telling his disciples, there's something new. There's a new covenant. They didn't get it in the moment. They had no idea what was gonna transpire 14 hours later, less than 14 hours. They had no idea that Jesus would die the most horrific way in the ancient world being Roman crucifixion. See, before this, your relationship with God was dependent upon the obedience to the law. This is why the Pharisees that you and I read in the Gospels, this is why they came up with 613 extra little rules to make sure you followed the law because your relationship was dependent upon the obedience to the law. And Jesus says, no, no, no. This relationship is now dependent on the blood of me. Everything changes now because Jesus knew something about the law, what the law couldn't do, but what his blood would do, and blood would conquer sin, and the law can't. It needed the perfect sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice to buy us back into right relationship with our Heavenly Father. So the team's gonna lead us into a song called The Blood. I wanna invite you to hold your communion cup. You can take a seat, you can stand through this song, you could come and kneel at the altar if you just wanna thank God for what he did for you. But I'm asking you to hold this during the song. You can sing, let the worship team sing over you and reflect on the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Getting harder to recognize the person I was. Encountered Christ. I don't walk like I used to. I don't talk like I used to. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not explain but nothing's more real than this in the presence of God or oh, what my heart experienced when my shame hit the wayside and my sin at the most high I was washed from the inside I was washed from the inside out
thing that Jesus tells his bride to remember that Christians all across the globe we do as a unified body of Christ is communion and I said that in the 9 a.m. service and Nicole leans over and says something to me that is all about that idea of unity this with actually uh, the women's fitness group on Monday um, and it just pertains again there's two points in here but during the last supper John tells us in 17 um, verse 20 it starts I am praying not only for these disciples but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message I pray that you will all be one just as you and I are one as you are in me father I am in you and they may be in you they, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. So not only does God want us to be united in our, even though we have different views or perceptions, he wants us to be united so we can show the world that God is real. Amen. But also 
the thought of the fact that at the Last Supper, he prayed for us then. That's just amazing. Yeah, thank you. Unified together. If you'll take that chalice and open up the side that has that little wafer together. I want you just to open it and then hold it in your hands. And remember here at Radiant Life, you don't have to be a member, but we ask you to be a follower of Jesus, to partake. It's something that Christians do together as a body of God. That bread, symbolic, sacred, spiritual, Jesus' body. When you take, do it with a thankful heart, remembering Jesus' broken body to set you free. You may partake. Then if you flip it over and you get to the juice, Symbolic, sacred, spiritual. The juice that Jesus says, this is my blood shed for you. And because of this, we remember that you and I now walk in freedom. That our sins have been washed away. And we are covered in the blood of Jesus. Take it with a thankful heart. Thank you, Jesus. What a beautiful reminder. Unifying brothers and sisters across this globe. We remember the sacrifice you did for us. We remember. May we continue each and every day to plead the blood of Jesus over ourselves. Every single day, may we plead the blood of Jesus. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
when you and I plead the blood of Jesus, there's a change that happens inside of us. It's a John 3 Nicodemus moment, and it's the 2 Corinthians 5, 17 moment. They're on the screen here for you. In John 3, 3, Jesus talking to Nicodemus and he says this, Jesus replied to him, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, you gotta be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. You gotta have a life transformation moment of an all moment surrender to this King of Kings and his name is Jesus. He says, Nicodemus, you'll never see the kingdom if that doesn't happen. Plead the blood of Christ over you. Paul writes to the church and the Christians in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and he's talking, remind yourself, he's talking to Christians. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you plead the blood of Jesus today that his covering is over you, you are in Christ. It says he's a new creation. The old's passed away. I see the new has come. I'm completely different with the blood of Christ in my life. And here's what we're gonna close today. We're gonna sing the song Monday Morning Faith as our closing. Our prayer partners, you can come down to the side if you need prayer. They would love to lift you up in prayer. But we're closing with this song for a reason. You and I don't just plead the blood of Christ on Sunday morning. You plead the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and on Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Our faith is a 24 seven type of faith. And we gotta own it and we know I am born again. I have belong to the kingdom of God and I'm a new creation. Let's worship together and close out our service with this song.
some of us are just completely overwhelmed 
by that love that you poured out for us. And some of us have been just striving so hard to earn your love and we just need to receive your gift. Thank you so much, Lord. I would imagine some of us are even challenged in this moment of just sitting at the table with Jesus. Maybe we're just challenged right now in this moment about who's sitting at our table. Lord, there's one thing that's undeniable that you are worthy. You deserve all of the honor and glory. So we thank you, Jesus. Lord, now we change our focus. And for, for many students, they, they begin to start school tomorrow. And so, Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over our students who are going to school. We plead the blood of Jesus over the teachers and the administrators in these schools. And Lord, there's a lot of them who are in love with you, who are in deep relationship with you. And so Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over these students and these teachers and these administrators. And we pray that you would give them a holy boldness that could only come from you, Lord. That others would taste and see your goodness. And so Lord, we ask and plead the blood, but we plead for a blessing over our school districts, over the students, over the teachers and administrators. And may you absolutely get all the honor and glory. And Lord, even right now, I'm reminded of how chaotic the first day of school is in the parking lots. And Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over the parents that we would honor you in the way that we enter those parking lots, in our frustration and in the hurry. Lord, convict us. May we honor you with everything, including our driving tomorrow morning in the schools, Lord. Oh man, we need a filling of your spirit because there's no way we're gonna be able to do it. Lord, thanks for meeting us here today. Thank you for the conviction. Thank you for showing us your love. Thanks for, thanks for answering the prayer from earlier, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and all God's people said, amen, amen. If you need to be prayed for, our prayer partners are down in the corners. But friends, let's go and be radiant. We'll see you guys next week.